Welcome everyone. Thank you for deciding to spend your Friday night with us. Uh, we didn't really think about basketball. Um, so we're very impressed that we have this many people choosing poetry over basketball. Thank you, thank you. Really, the applause goes out to you. I am Lindsay Garcia, Meadowlark's publicist um, and poetry editor here and there. Um, I'm happy to be your host this evening along with my compatriots. We have Tracy Million Simmons over here, our Meadowlark Press publisher. And we have a few of our Birdie Poetry Prize winners and finalists from previous years. Um, and our guest judge, who you don't know is in the audience, is in the audience. Um, and we also have our winner in the audience. So full of surprises. I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and thank you, Lindsay, for, for hosting this for us. Um, this is really exciting. This is the fourth year of the Birdie Poetry Prize, and I never imagined that this contest was going to get so big so quickly. Um, it has been a privilege reading all the amazing poetry. Manuscripts from across the United States, really, it just amazes me that our little metal arc has gone so many directions. Um, I have to say that you all make the world feel like a brighter, better place. Uh, who would imagine? Um, so welcome, it's exciting to see so many of you here. And like Lindsay said, I'm, I'm a little surprised that we got all our, our poets here when there's such important basketball going on tonight. So thank you and let's get started. First up, we are going to hear poems from Valentine by Ruth Moss. Ruth, a native of Topeka, Kansas, has pursued a love of learning around the world with languages, curiosity, and an appreciation for all beings a constant thread. She is the author of the 2019 Birdie finalist book, Valentine. Ruth, please take it away. Well, thanks, Lindsay. And I have to say, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to read. Um, I'm bummed that I didn't win, but you know, that's good that there are lots and lots and lots of entries and great, according to Tracy, and I'm sure great poets and poetry that's been submitted. So thanks for letting me uh, read. I write a lot of um, existential poems and especially this last year, but I'm not gonna read those because I think we've got enough gloom and doom already in the world. Um, and tonight we don't need that. So I'm gonna go back to some of my older poems from Valentine and um, a lot of those were rhymed and metered, and some of them were just downright light verse. So I'm going to kind of read some of those. So I'll start with communities. Can tadpoles with no obvious pectoral fins consider cocker spaniels and stockbrokers their twins? Can the bishop embrace the turpentine and debris from branches of roaches on his family tree? If the village idiot were not our king of bones, if our sharpened knives were plowshares or rhinestones, would happiness envelop all whose sentience flows from the tributaries of connectedness? Still the old woman sweeps the floor of her hut and sighs as the mayor knickers for bran or maybe French fries and crocodiles shed tears and repo men repossess, and the universe wears a starry organza dress. This one is called Alan Ate the Earring. Alan ate the earring, not because he was hungry, but because he was a terrible two and fixated on the shiny razzmatazz with turquoise florets and deadly screw on back. He only ate one. Perhaps it wasn't tasty enough for seconds, or maybe the little omnivore got caught before more co coveting. Stuff him with bread and mashed potatoes, the doctor said. He had seen this before. After many years, the earrings and matching bracelet have passed, so to speak, to Alan's sister, but she neither wears them. <clears throat> she neither wears them nor eats them. Uh, 
that actually happened. <laughs> this one is called the convenience store clerk and this actually happened too. The young man wore his misery as a skin. More than the taxidermy for his meat, it was the impasse of his cells, the glue grip of his respirations. It was his cardboard voice accusing, what do you want? And the intravenous mud transfused and slow dripped throughout some fingernail hanging life. The customers purchased some barbecue chips and a lottery ticket, but no one would touch the shriveled hot dogs. Uh, okay, this is just for fun. I'm sure you wouldn't be here tonight unless you were a poetry geek. So this is my poem for poetry geeks. And there is some audience participation in it. And I'll let you know when. Poem for Poetry Geeks. With, poem, with poems, I have a rendezvous. I didn't mean to, but I do. My own poems don't always flow, a fate most English majors know, compared to the sublime excess as, how do I love these, coalesce, and ravens quoth, and brigades die, and roads diverge in a wood, and I have water, water everywhere but don't go gentle anywhere. And still I rise where sidewalks end and lonely clouds are my best friend. A loaf of bread, a jug of wine, a summer's day, a pickup line. Soon love is like a red, red rose. Or two if by sea, I suppose. Then there's the Jabberwocky song. It howls a bit. So I was wrong that coy mistress was a sham for Mary had a little lamb to go with her green audience green exit hand. yes <laughs> see you are poetry geeks I knew it to go with her green eggs and ham so now I'm captain of my soul and know full well for whom bells toll that's why wild nights instead of thee I wrap myself in poetry. In doing so, I do not sleep. I take to the open road. I weep. I walk in beauty like the night and sail a pea green boat in spite of life with loveliness to sell and seven circles just for hell. There Grecian urn, calico cat and mighty Casey at the bat sing odes to nightingales for years then part in silence and in tears. While Gunga Din, may his tribe increase and Agamemnon and his niece play Lady of Shalott till dawn, then go where Simon's Pyman's gone. Between the crosses, row on row, like weeds as country churchyards go. Well, it's never been more clear to me in such praiseworthy company I think that I shall never see a Nobel Prize for poetry. That's it, thank you very much. <laughs> Hope it gave you something to smile about. Next up, we have Brian Daldorf. Brian is the author of the 2020 Birdie finalist book, Kansas Poems. He teaches at the University of Kansas and the Douglas County Jail. He recently released a memoir about teaching creative writing at the jail. Words is a powerful thing. He serves as editor for Coal City Review. Kansas Poems is his eighth and newest poetry collection. Brian, please take it away. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, reading, Ruth. That was, that was great. That puts us all in the right mood for this, I think. That was great. So I'm going to read a number of poems from Kansas poems, and then I'd like to read a couple of poems by my friend too. But I'll start with poems from this book. So this book is divided into the four seasons, and that just seemed a good way to organize the poems. The poems were written over probably maybe even the 30 years or so that I've been in Kansas, and I just 
I brought them together for this uh, manuscript. So they were poems from very sort of different times of my life, but they all in one way or another were about this place, this, uh, this great state. So the, the book begins with my section about spring, which seemed appropriate because that's right where we are now. So I'd like to read a number of poems from that section. This first one is called Magnolia in May, Lawrence, Kansas. What we did in my parents' garden, we should have done for our marriage. Plucked off brown withering petals of the magnolia, dropped them in a black bucket so strong new buds could push through. My mother showed us how to do it. We did it in her garden, didn't do it at home, and then it was too late for flowers. I've always been fascinated by the magnolia, which blooms for just about a week or so, doesn't it? And that seems like such a, a wonderful thing. This poem is um, about uh, Menningers in Topeka. I went over there in 2008 actually, and the big campus had closed down. And that seemed to be a kind of uh, metaphor for, for what they were doing there. And so that's, that's where this poem started. It's called uh, Menningers, Topeka, May 2008. Big sort of psychiatric hospital campus. It's closed for business now. So if your mind's walls are cracked, your windows broken, if your foundation's slipping and you need a new roof after the hailstorm, Menningers can't help you anymore. Boarded up windows, the famous clock stopped, fences up to keep the bums out, the look and reek of decay. You'll have to find some other place for repair. Just like you, Menningers is falling down. Then I've been doing work in jails, prisons for a long time now. And so quite a number of these poems had to do with that. Most often they were kind of um, fictionalized versions of things that I'd experienced, people that I'd met. So there's a kind of distance between the poetry and the mm -hmm. event. But um, this is one that I'd like to read. It's called uh, Visiting Findlay. It's a cold spring morning, sunny with clear sky and I'm driving through Kansas on my way to Mission City to visit my son, Findlay, in prison. I wrote and asked if he'd like me to visit. He wrote back, yeah, you can come. I'm on my way to a small town with a big prison on the edge of town that was supposed to revive the city, but instead just sits where cornfields used to be, a big white elephant made out of concrete, misery, and wire. Findlay lost his way after he got hurt playing football at Duco, ruined his knee in a tackle. Doctors did their best to repair it, but said he'd limp for the rest of his life. They gave him painkillers and got him hooked. He slid into petty crime to support his habit, got involved in a robbery that went wrong. The liquor store owner was shot and Findlay got 10 years. I show the guard at the gate my driving license, drive into the parking lot, I imagine visiting him with his pretty wife and first child. With 10 years carved out of his life, how's he going to achieve anything like that? Who'd want to marry an ex-con? It takes me half an hour to get through security and 10 doors later, I'm in the meeting room, a row of cubicles with chairs in front of glass screens. I sit in my place and wait for Findlay, for my son gone wrong, my tattooed hard-eyed son, the son I tried to love but didn't love enough, the son who never made it easy. I wait for my son. I heard a lot of stories like that and that kind of brought them all together. Then I'd like to read two poems from my friend John, who is a Vietnam veteran, 
John Musgrave, I'm sure some of you know him, um, featured in the recent um, documentary about Vietnam. This first one is called Old Soldier, and it was um, written about uh, going to uh, Haskell with John for a, a cemetery there, a, a ceremony, sorry, there. And um, this is uh, this is what I, I wrote about for John. Old soldier holds himself out to the crossroads where the damn government's building a new road straight through the heart of Indian country. Damn politicians never change. The old soldier knows that. They'll sell you out for a penny, cut your heart out for 10. Old soldier keeps marching in his broken boots. Soon it will be time to march all the way back to that ambush in the bush. Those shots in the chest that should have killed him, did kill him. It's just that he's taking a long time to die. I'd known John for a long time and I mean, his story is just so interesting and so significant. Uh, that's why he was featured in the Ken Burns documentary about the Vietnam War. And I couldn't really write anything about him for so long. And then suddenly I just sat down and wrote this poem and it was exactly what I'd wanted to say for, for so long. This is called Tug of War. My friend John was so badly wounded in Vietnam that he knew he was dying. He'd seen a lot of guys with chest wounds like his wound, a sucking wound, and none of them survived it. He prayed, he tried to make his peace with God. Then by some miracle, he's still trying to figure out, he did survive it. Spent 18 months in the hell hole of hospital recovering from that wound. When he staggered out of hospital, all he wanted to do was to go back to his war, where he had a gun in his hand and knew who his enemies were, where he knew his buddies would never let him down. No one could say he hadn't done his part, so surely he could, he could go home now. But all he felt was the tug of war. And then I want to read um, two poems by my friend Antonio Sanchez Bay. I worked with him at Douglas County Jail, and this is his book. And we're all um, mourning Antonio. Those of us who knew him, he died uh, about one year ago, and he is very much missed by people who, who knew him. This is what he wrote. This is called A Poet's Heart. Lines composed on writing paper comprised of words scribbled on various pieces of paper, scrap paper, court papers, jailhouse request forms, receipts, even napkins, depict the legacy of this wounded heart that despite its constant anguish, still pumps life. A heart that, beat to, that beats to the rhythm of Mother Earth's drums, a heart that flashes like lightning, across the darkest skies. A heart that burns with desire and does not extinguish in the hardest of rain or strongest of winds. A heart with the insatiable hunger of this starving artist. A heart that was once frozen, that now flows like streams into rivers, into oceans, into the sea of life. This heart is the heart of the poet. And then this poem by Antonio, which I always think about when I think about him. Raindrops of sadness. Raindrops of sadness wash away the pain. Help me forget as I dance in the rain. The sun can shine tomorrow and I will be okay. But I'd rather bask in raindrops of sadness just for today. And then I'll just read two more poems from uh, Kansas poems.
This one is called Lonely. She talks to her houseplants, calls them by their names, makes her tea at 4 p.m. and sits in her favorite chair to stare out the front window at 13th Street in the sun, flickering leaves across the street. Another funeral passing down 13th on its way to Oak Hill Cemetery. She, wish, she wishes she could go and stand by the grave with relatives and say he was a fine man. Afterwards, she'd eat cake and drink tea with them, listening to what they have to say. Perhaps a little granddaughter would hug her, tell her how she's getting on in school. Who will drive behind her hearse? Her no good son and his floozy wife, snooty neighbors, her sister on her last visit, her houseplants on back of a rented truck. And then this is the, uh, the last poem in the book and it uh, seemed to be the, the right sort of ending for, for what I was trying to do in the book. It's called Estate Sale. It was about my neighbor actually, Estate Sale. All day Saturday, a crowd at my neighbor's house on 13th Street, empty for five years. The auctioneer rattles off his call. One dollar, dollar, dollar fifty, dollar fifty-two. You all know how auctioneers do it. There's not much left of her life. Boxes of junk sold off as lots for a few dollars to traders in bib overalls and baseball caps. 23 chairs, good for firewood on the sidewalk. The thermometer registering 53 degrees in February sun. Sunday morning bird song and the odd car. Outside her house by 13th street, the leftovers of her life. Brass floor lamp, split cushions, old books and pictures wet through from last night's rain. Uh, I'd just like to, to say, um, that, that I'm just honored to be a part of Meadowlark and I, I love the, the work that um, Tracy and Lindsay and others do, do with the press and I encourage you all to just um, look at uh, what they're publishing and they're doing so much great work and uh, please try to support this press because I think it's doing some really uh, important things. Thank you very much. Alison Hicks is the author of Poetry Collections, Knowing is a Branching Trail, the 2021 Birdie Poetry Prize winner. You Who Took the Boat Out and Kiss, a chapbook, Falling Dreams, and a novella, Love, a Story of Images. Her work has appeared in Eclipse, Gargoyle, Permafrost, and Poet Lore, among other journals. She was named a finalist for the 2021 uh, Bula Rose Prize by Smartish Pace, was nominated for a Pushcart Prize by Green Hills Literary Lantern, and has received two fellowships from the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts. She graduated summa cum laude from Bryn Mawr College and holds an MFA from the University of Arizona. In 1996, she founded Greater Philadelphia Wordshop Studio to support writers in the development of their individual voices and practice of their craft through community-based workshops and private consultation. With Elizabeth, with Elizabeth Mosier and Therese Hallshed, she co-edited Prompted, an anthology of work from the first 13 years of the Wordshop studio. She lives in Havertown, Pennsylvania with her husband, Charles Griffinstein. Learn more about Allison at philowordshop.com. Hi, I'm Allison Hicks, the winner of the 2021 Birdie Prize. And I want to congratulate the 2022 winner um, you will love working with Tracy and Lindsay and Meadowlark Books. Um, and I'm sorry I'm, I'm unable to be with you tonight. Um, Lindsay suggested that I might make a video of uh, reading of some poems from my book, Knowing is a Branching Trail, um, with this lovely cover. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and I'm going to start with the uh, title poem. Knowing is a branching trail that disappears into variety. It is hard to find something you have not first imagined. 
Only a small portion of the world is known with accuracy, Darwin wrote. Eddie Acherins went extinct 541 million years ago. Their tracks can be seen at Mistaken Point, Newfoundland. They look like a series of parentheses laid inside each other. Soft body, mouth and anusless, somehow they began to crawl, pushing disc-like bodies forward. They were hunting or escaping a predator. We don't know. We're not even sure they were animals. They could have been plants, fungi, or colonies of single-celled organisms. It could have been an accident, extending bodies into the stream, washed from their perch, like anemones pried from their rocks who creep across sand to a hard surface. They might have stretched suction cup feet across a gelatin of bacterial mats, working to feel their way back. Um, and all of the events in this poem actually happened. <laughs> this is Starling's uh, one. He was hanging by a leg from the gutter of our house. Dead, of course, by the time we noticed he must have been scouting for a nest and somehow his foot caught. There he stayed, tavern sign or tarot card, the hanged starling. Two, what did it mean? We wanted to know. How long had it taken for the bird to die? A human being would have yelled until someone heard and brought opposable thumbs to unhook what was caught. Was he stoic? in the way we expect animals to be? Or had he made a sound we didn't recognize or understand? Three, it wasn't easy to reach him, so we let him hang all fall. And when it got cold, we came inside and forgot. In spring, we looked up from the patio and he was gone. Loosened by icicles or taken by a squirrel or hollowed out so much hanging there that his body blew away. Four. Shortly after we'd moved in, a starling fell down our chimney. He landed on the hearth, took a couple of jerky steps, then flew up, full wings wider and stronger than I expected. My instinct was to duck his to fly, so he made for the stairs, wings grazing my hair. He churned the air, beating and thrashing in that artificially enclosed place, the shelter we needed, having lost the fur that had protected us, his power, our diminishment. Five, once we gave it some thought, it wasn't so difficult to get him out. We turned off the lights in the house, kept the porch light on, then we opened the door. Six, we had a wire grate placed over the chimney. Sometimes they nest outside my office in the space between the air conditioner and the windowsill. They make a song that isn't quite a song, a low coo trill that enters under the threshold of my hearing. Uh, and uh, since we're on birds, <laughs> here's another bird, uh, the pelicans. You could be swimming along, minding your own when the shock from that body hits. Watch out, fish. Now that these flyboys are back, they live to tuck and drill down. They'll scoop you up, hinge back their gullets, snap them shut on a trip you're not coming back from. Pelicans fly low up the coast in formation with few strokes, heads back, scanning the waves. They used to fly into Fisherman's Wharf for R&R &R until the authorities chased them off. Rougher and larger close up, lounging on the railings, strutting in their battered jackets, peering down their oversized beaks at the crowds gathered to get a look at the outlaws. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, I think I'll, I'll read another animal poem. This is Sea Otter. 
thicker than seal, denser than mink, the fur for which you hunted us almost to extinction. You celebrate our survival as your success, stuff fabric likenesses of, for your young. Approaching our rafts, you judge our lives undemanding. How pleasant to wrap oneself in kelp and ride the waves. You forget our sharp teeth and our drudgery. Our omnivore metabolisms drive. We carry no blubber, less body fat than you. We must dive and dive and dive. A quarter of our body weight a day consumed. Squid, abalone, urchin, whatever we can find. And after, groom, each hair precisely arrayed, skin exposed is death. We've been to the bottom and felt its offerings. We, like you, must surface. Um, okay. Uh, the Oryx. I had been kept in darkness, had not eaten in some days. When they brought me out into the hall, men were feeding the blaze on the floor. It hurt my eyes. I squinted, turned away. They gave me the drink. I climbed up, lay on my back on the frame they had constructed. Light traveled, unfolding over stone. I reached my hand to meet the wall and waited. They showed themselves first as tremors, barely detectable th below my fingers, growing as they came on until the sound of their hooves was a roar. I stretched to brush their flanks and as they passed, they became visible to me and I marked them as they came on, their pendant bellies, tapered horns, their noses, knobby knees. They ran through the rock to make others see I marked them. Um, and that, as you probably figured out, is a persona poem. Um, and you might wonder about the figures. They are uh, from the Lescaux, the, the cave paintings at Lescaux, France. Um, okay, uh, coming back to birds, <laughs> this is yellow bird. I want to believe in a world beneath this one. The bird that flies across the lawn is a messenger. That if I follow her in my mind, I will come to a door. She will let me through to the underside of the world. I will look at my life from below, my husband and son walking the bottom of their shoes. Other times, I think, there is no door, nothing below. The bird flying bent on her own purposes, her color the outcome of natural selection. Nothing mystical, just the world working itself out. Hummingbirds are squeaking, dive bombing the feeder. I, too, sitting right side up in this world. The bird keeps coming back the bird speaking through me. How it is. The white car that lives in the white of the eye comes out of the sun behind the line of parked cars, the potted plant on the corner. Always there, travels submarine, hides in white blood cells, cruises arteries and veins, slides through the body politic. All the times it hasn't shown, you've sensed its filmy existence, so never completely a surprise when it surfaces in peripheral vision. The white car could be an actual car. It could be an election, getting lost in the woods for five days and nights, a birth or death. Too late to hit the gas, to swerve, always your fault. Tuck your head as it pulls you down. Slide through until it stops. Uh, it occurs to me reading this poem now that uh, the white car could also be a pandemic. Uh, all right. Uh, 
North Pacific. One, when trapped under ropes or suspended in ice, seawater may seep through imperfections. When the netting wears off, its pattern may remain. Two, fishermen's floats blown from sake bottles turn in the North Pacific, Japan to Alaska to California and back across the Pacific. Two, breaking free on storms or tides, some wash up on the beaches of Taiwan, Canada, and the Northwest US. They have been found in coral reefs and on the windward side of Guam. A few are stuck in the Arctic ice pack. It is believed that floats washing up in Alaska have spent seven to 10 years in the gyre, that most have been afloat longer than that. Four, the ones my mother hung in the window of our old apartment were replicas, most likely from Cost Plus, decanted sea colors of early childhood, blue and green currents of family life, bubbles and streaks in uneven glass. Um, my son is uh, now a junior at University of Colorado Boulder, and this is a poem that I wrote after we dropped him off uh, for his freshman year. Flatirons. From anywhere in the city so close, look up and there they are, intimate, as if you could press against the chalky slabs red-brown rising from crush of pines, flat irons. No mystery to the name, heavy triangles of iron used to smother wrinkles out of clothes. They imprint so that one might reasonably pine for them after a few short hours. Sheared off slabs grow smaller in the rear view as we press on. Flat irons press, tower slabs, close pines. Uh, the other thing that I probably should say about that poem is it is a half sestina. Uh, so if you heard some uh, repeated words, uh, that's, uh, that was uh, part of the sestina and, uh, and then the envoy at the end. Uh, okay, and um, I like to, uh, to finish up my reading here with a poem that actually isn't in this book, um, but is very relevant to the area uh, where Meadowlark Books is located. Um, and I wrote it um, on when we drove uh, uh, across uh, taking Jeremy to Boulder, and we stopped at the uh, Tallgrass Prairie uh, uh, National um, uh, Park, and uh, uh, we spent a day, um, and it was wonderful. So this is tall grass. I do not believe in the afterlife, but in a journey that carries us from one state of being to another. It happens in the time it takes to draw a breath that might be experienced as months or years. Say we open eyes in tall grass prairie like the grasslands in which our species was born. Indian grass, blue stem, switchgrass, rosinweed, coneflower, bison, prairie dogs. Fires sweep through controlling growth of trees. Wind blows us from this soft land into rising dryness, soapwood yucca, plains prickly pear, honey mesquite, short grass, blue grandma, buffalo grass, hailstorms, blizzards, tornado, drought. Asinwadi, seen across the prairies, they look like a rocky mass. Ascend cottonwood to one seed juniper, ponderosa, Douglas fir, quaking aspen, lodgepole and bristlecone pine, blue spruce. Um, and uh, Asinwadi is the Cree word for the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so 
thank you for uh, allowing me to be a part of this evening, even though I couldn't be here in person. And um, congratulations again to the 2022 Birdie Reader. Um, and thank you, uh, Tracy and Lindsay. Good night. We're so glad that Allison was up for doing that and that you still got to hear her read. Um, it's interesting thinking that it was this time last year where we got to announce her and hear her read for the first time. All right, folks. Well, this is the time that we've all been waiting for. Um, Tracy, if you would like to introduce Awards part of this event, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. This is the exciting part. Um, we're going to start with um, our list of semi finalists. We had so many excellent entries this year. So, our semi finalists, I'm going to go ahead and read through the names. I think many, many of them are here. So, feel free to give us a wave or stand up and take a bow. Um, these are all wonderful, wonderful poetry manuscripts, and I expect to see them published someday by someone, if not by Metalark. Um, Robert Cooperman, Denver, Colorado, for Steerage. Blair Dietz, Ormond Beach, Florida, for Wintergreen. Chris Allergy, San, or San Angelo, Texas, Broken Into Being. Gail Griffin from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Omina Bay Testament, Brenda Gunn, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, Ancestral Poems About a Man, a man Who Knew of Me, Emily Hockaday, Glendale, New York, Blood Music, William Heath from Frederick, Maryland, Going Places, Candace Kelsey, Evans, Georgia, Unscrew the Lid, A Refrain, George Looney, Erie, Pennsylvania, Things Still Worth Trying to Do, Ruth Moss, Topeka, Kansas, Puzzled, Todd Palmer, Port Orange, Florida, for Savannah Crossing, David Petrozelli, New York, New York, Opera Days, Cinema Nights, Mary Jean Port, Minneapolis, Minnesota, for Unclaimed Freight, John Savoy, Edwardsville, Illinois, for Sinsucht. Sorry about my pronunciation. Mark Smith Soto, Greensboro, North Carolina, for time being. And Amy Sage Webb Baza from America's Kansas, female protagonist. Congratulations to all of our semi finalists. And now, um, I don't even know how to describe these folks. If they're, if if we had so many shining stars, these are the the brightest of them. Uh, our 2022 finalists for the Birdie Poetry Prize, and this is in alphabetical order, I believe, by last name. We have Tina Barr from Black Mountain, North Carolina, for Pink Moon. Carol Davis, Los Angeles, California, for Below Zero. Sue Fagalde Lick from South Beach, Oregon, for Scotch Tape and Paper Clips. I think that may be my favorite title. Andrew Morrison, San Antonio, Texas, A Journey to the Western Isles. Spence Porter from Bronx, New York, Tiny Pink Heart. Janet Road from Albert Lee, Minnesota, No Matter How It Ends. Jennifer Walker from Mankato, Kansas, Prairie Girl, and Margaret Young from Beverly, Massachusetts for the Water Bear. Congratulations to all of our finalists. And now um, I get the pleasure of introducing you to our 2022 Birdie Poetry Prize judge, an amazing poet a metal art poet, in fact, and he's given me one of our favorite descriptions of metal art to date. In an interview with David Garian, he called Metal Art Press a small but mighty band of poetry partisans 
deep in the rural heart of Kansas. I need to figure out how to put that on a t-shirt or something. I'll jump right into it. Let me introduce Bart Edelman. Bart has poetry collections including Crossing the Hackensack, Under Damaris's Dress, The Alphabet of Love, The Gentleman, The Gentleman, The Last Mojito, The Geographer's Wife, and Whistling to Trick the Wind, which was just released early this year by Metal Art Press. Bart has taught at Glendale College, where he edited Eclipse, a literary journal, UCLA, and most recently in the MFA program at Antioch University, Los Angeles. His work has been widely anthologized in textbooks published by City Lights Books, Etruscan Press, Harcourt Brace, McGraw-Hill, Prentice Hall, Simon & Schuster, Thomas Heinley, the University of Iowa Press, and others. He lives in Pasadena, California, which we also like to refer to as the Metalark West office. Thank you, Bart, for sharing your time and talent with Metalark Press, and I'm going to let you take it away. Uh, first of all, what an honor and pleasure to judge this year's Birdie Prize. I enjoyed reading all of the manuscripts that fell my way. There, were a bevy of there was a bevy of talent from across the nation, embracing varied styles, subjects, and narrative voices. Certainly, many submissions were worthy of the top prize. However, my poetic eye and a part of my soul ultimately chose Jonathan Greenhouse's Cupping Our Palms. Here's a note about Jonathan followed by comments regarding his work, and then one poem in particular that struck me as a solid representation of that winning manuscript. Jonathan Greenhouse has won the Telluride Institute's Fisher Poetry Prize, the Prison Review Poetry Prize, Aesthetica Magazine's Creative Writing Award in Poetry, and the Ledbury Poetry Competition. His poems have appeared in The Believer, Flint Hills Review, New York Quarterly, Notre Dame Review, Poetry Ireland Review, The Poetry Society, Rhino, Subtropics, and The Times Literary Supplement. Jonathan lives in Jersey City with his wife and their two sons all within a stone's throw of the local freight line. And these are my words concerning his manuscript, which won the Birdie Prize. These provocative, trustworthy poems owe their strength to narrators who are not afraid to confront their own sense of awe, misgivings, and incredulity as it pertains to their various stations in life. The prevailing subject of parenthood and what it means to shepherd children through the stages of growth keeps circling in this superb collection, none more so than in the perfect dad. Long before this final section, however, we witness personal journeys towards reconciliation and how to parent not only a child, but also humankind on a practical, universal level. Cupping Our Palms has a stirring habit of casting its readers far out into a sea of curiosity and wonder, and then, rather methodically, reeling or easing its audience back to shore, turn by gradual turn through its eloquent language and structural change of pace. Compelling as beacons of light, not for sale, parabolic, and relics appear, their gateways to more profound questions the poet addresses and destiny poses to all readers. Yes, here are rich, haunting poems replete with honest voices whose declarations linger long after the collection is complete, lessons well learned, but never quite at rest. 
And this is just one poem called Parabolic that I, I think uh, brings Jonathan's work here to light. Parabolic. We were never taught how to be parents. Our children thrust upon us like makeshift disasters, held out as awkwardly as possible, their limbs jutting in all directions. And we, staring, awaited someone to mercifully take them back. No one ever takes them back. They scale us, disappointed by their view on top as if trek, trekking Mount Everest's rubbish strewn trails, their lofty idols tainted by waste. Our majestic height is inflated, strip mined by successive absences at school plays, by our failure to listen to the saccharine notes of their pop music. Still, we carry on, clinging like grunts upon our secret armory of language, most pinpoint where we'll make the incision, hopeful or loosened words might graze them like butterflies, briefly soaring. Like the parabolic rise of stones flung towards the quivering slipshod wreck of our distant homes. No one will ever load them like we do. We lay ourselves down, sacrificial slabs of splintered wood connecting tracks as their trains rumble out of view. Congratulations, Jonathan, on winning this award. You richly deserve it. Uh, I would love to thank Tracy and Lindsay and Bart. Uh, Bart, that was beautiful. I, I feel like that the way that you described the collection is better than I could ever have described it. And uh, you understood just exactly what I was trying to do with the changes of pace and, and the overall um, meaning of the entire collection. Thank you so much for selecting this. Thank you to the finalists also and the semi-finalists, everyone who writes poetry. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Tracy. Um, it's wonderful to have this um, have this be published. I'm, I'm kind of at a loss of words. I'm still processing the whole aspect of being uh, having this selected and, and being able to put this out there in the world. Um, without further ado, I will read the poems that I've selected to read tonight. I've got seven poems from the collection. They're all pretty short, so it should clock in under 10 minutes. Um, and that's it. I'm really glad to share this. Obviously, I'm from Jersey City, so I had to give up watching St. Peter's play in the tournament today. I've not even looked at the score. I'm just gonna be in the moment and I'm sure they'll either do fine or not do fine, whether or not I'm watching it. Um, so with that said, I will read the first poem, um, which, and by the way, um, I was listening to Brian read and when he read the poem about uh, Menninger's and he mentioned it was May in 2008, I thought about beginnings and endings. And that was the month that I met my wife. May of 2008. So it's, you know, sometimes, uh, well, kind of like kids also, things begin and end, and it's all just a continuation of time. Um, with that said, I will read the first poem. Also a poem about starlings, like Allison's. Uh, it's called Thanks a Lot, Shakespeare, for the starlings, for the starling. The window single paned to preserve not heat, but historical significance presses down upon the simple plank preventing it from shutting. And in that humble rectangular board, there's a hole through which reasoning escapes, a metallic accordion-like tube stretching from the dryer's back end to the opening where the starling enters, where it places twig after twig to construct a metaphor for impracticality and absurdity, a snapshot of modern life, of our climactic uncertainty. Like building a home on the rim of a smoldering caldera, its flimsy walls trembling. In 1890, 60 starlings were released in Central Park by the American Acclimatization Society because Shakespeare made mention of them in Henry IV, Part I, wrote, Nay, I'll have a starling shall be taught to speak, nothing but Mortimer, and give it to him to keep his anger still in motion. By the end of the play, 
the battle rages on, the Hundred Years' War still unresolved. Now we've got over 200 million starlings in North America. My wife and I let it stay. We hang wet clothes upon the backs of chairs, upon our shower rod, learn to harness solar energy. We do, the, we do without these modern conveniences, teach our sons to appreciate the subtle rumblings of an egg set to crack, a fledgling poised to press its luck upon the edge, upon the ledge. My next poem is called Beacons of Light. The sea will claim what belongs to the sea, says my son at age six. We're steering a rusted fishing vessel in the middle of the Atlantic. Cattle soar above us in a jetliner heading to pasture land. The sea's just another word for oblivion, says my son, as he reels in another refugee and gently hugs her, wraps her in the emergency mylar blanket. He pulls out a cell phone, activates Google Translate, and the woman's Arabic becomes, your president is a vulture with a hunger for its own eggs, as she pleads to be taken somewhere else, maybe Canada. The other refugees nod their heads, tell tall tales of a distant Manitoba. The sea will devour our beacons of light in their death rows, says my son, as he leaps overboard, dives beneath the sky's reflection, saves a small shivering boy, barely distinguishable from himself. And back to that same child, um, this is called, a year later, Damn Our Short-Sightedness. I'm only semi-conscious, body sunk into couch cushions, a maritime wreck barely breaching the surface as my six-year-old starts sobbing from where he sits by his melted cup of ice cream, his tears, salt-tinged bullets splitting through my skin as if by M16, as if that sadness being quantifiable, if firmly held, might plunge my soul into the molten bowels of this earth. And I know I shouldn't laugh when he explains to me between anguished gulps of air that he's crying because he ate his ice cream too quickly because he was afraid zombies would break down our double bolted front door or climb through our third floor windows, which damn our short sightedness, aren't boarded up or outfitted with crossbows. I summon all the courage I can as a parent and I'm able to successfully avoid laughing at this for roughly a second or two before hopelessly succumbing to my insensitivity, my sense of humor winning out over the urge to comfort, even as I draw him towards me, wrap him in my arms, resist the understandable temptation to pretend to devour his brains. For all of you Walking Dead fans out there. Um, and then this next one is called The Fire Escape No Longer Weighed Down. The fire escape, no longer weighed down by tomato plants and basil, lifts up by micromillimeters towards the sky, and the sky peers down, is baffled by the limits it can and cannot know. How here it's the sky, but there it isn't. How a few degrees of air can lessen into nothing. Even a fire can wonder what it is, if it's only the flames or also the smoke, the heat dissipating into what may be sky into the fire escapes melted steel, how two things become one and how a single thing is almost never just one substance is always a little less or more, always a metamorphosis between what it was and what it'll be. Staring at the sky and the fire and the fire escape, the child only knows he's a child, something not quite adolescent, yet no longer crawling on all fours. He knows and doesn't know how this moment won't ever repeat how the smoke, which may or may not be part of the fire, seeps into his lungs, and how the fire escape melting into the fire is no longer an escape, but more like the sky, more like a stretch of nothing serving no use to him, all these things inevitably joining to become one in the same, the boy and the fire, the escape and the sky. I have um, three more poems left. This is called To Sugarcoat the Truth. Again, the same son as before. I have two, but for some reason, my older son at this point is appearing in most of the poems, who is now, he's now nine years old. Is it easier to be good or bad? My son inquires as the snow falls outside and covers the chilled body in its bed of autumn leaves. As a father, I've tried not to sugarcoat the truth 
even if it hints at genocide, at disasters made worse by our actions. So the snowdrift is the perfect place to conceal my first reply to his question. It's better to be good, but not easier. If we must kill, we do. Faced with starvation, we, true, we chew on what's edible, regardless of what's lost. For me, it's easier to be good, I tender, still uncertain where I stood. And this act, and actually that poem was um, unfortunately based on um, a body that was found in the, about a block from here, um, right by the freight train. Uh, there was uh, someone who was camping out there, we believe, um, and he um, passed away in the cold. Um, so that was the inspiration for that poem. Um, and uh, anyhow, uh, <laughs> This next poem is called A Poem Written in My Past Life as a 15th Century Georgian Monk. A, hold on, my computer is prompting me to restart the computer now. I will say um, no. <laughs> um, hold on one second. Okay, it's not restarting. That's a good sign. Okay. A Poem Written in My Past Life as a 15th Century Georgian Monk. Wouldn't start off like this would be surprised to find itself encaged in English written from the perspective of a 21st century American. Everything would be unsettling. The free verse, the abrupt line breaks, the passing allusion to the Soviet Union. What's a Soviet Union and what's an American? The poem would invariably question its own existence, would doubt the veracity of its origins, yet revel in its incongruity and its ability to transcend its beginnings. The Georgian monk would stare back at the page, marveling at his absurd creation, hardly giving himself time to let the ink dry. Yet every errant word would discover its place. He'd come back to the poem, crafting lines inspired by prayers or by the lack of them, and a hole would grow inside of him, greater than the bones strapping it in. He'd stuff it with orations, with the plunging of his hands into the soil of the monastery's garden, digging roots out, ingesting them, then adding a stanza about the Kardashians, imagining how this praise would surely please the heavens. And then this last poem is the poem that the um, manuscript is named after. It is called Cupping Our Palms. It's a very short one. Cupping Our Palms. Love is extending your cupped palms to cradle the blend of chewed up pizza and clementines in your two and a half year old's sudden vomits. It's warm acidity sticking your fingers, slipping down to the carpet below. Likely, he won't remember this later in life when you're proudly beaming at his wedding or when he's carefully guiding you back to your hospital bed, your gown flapping open at the back. But some subconscious part of him will vaguely recall, will extend his own cupped palms when the time comes to return the favor. Again, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Bart, for seeing something in this work. And thank you, Tracy, for Meadowlark and Lindsay as well. And thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. And, um, and just with everything that's happening in the world right now in Ukraine, um, I'm sending my prayers out to everyone there. And uh, as much as it can seem hopeless uh, and feel like, why are we even doing this when something's happening in the world that is so horrible, this is why we live. This is an important thing to do. You can't stop reading poetry. Poetry is one of the most important things to do in the world. And, and even people in Ukraine are reading poetry right now and hoping that this ridiculous stuff stops immediately. And uh, there's nothing I can say that's going to make that better. So I will just stop. But thank you so much for picking this book. And thank you. We share the sentiment. We need we need poetry. We need art. We need those things that keep the hope alive. Absolutely. We just really appreciate all of you folks who support us by submitting and by reading and by just helping us spread the word and coming to our events. Um, it's really great to know that we can we can build this community on all of those sides. Um, it's a really special community to be a part of.